Uh, welcome everyone again. We're going to start our event. Uh, thank you for joining us and being with us today uh, to listen to the highly celebrated scholars Yom Antoun and Bassam Haddad. Um, my, my name is Rim Turkmani. I head uh, research programs at the LSE. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'm going to show you some slides about our research. Uh, the title of our research project is called The Legitimacy and Citizenship in the Arab World. Today, we just launched our new website. I'm going to share with you uh, the links to the websites uh, here. It's distour.org or uh, syrianconstitutions.org. Uh, 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 we're filling that up uh, gradually with materials. Uh, and there are going to be a series of publications that are going to come out uh, uh, within the coming few months. Our project is sponsored by Carnegie Endowment for um, uh, uh, the <clears throat> sorry, uh, Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, one of our upcoming events, uh, which we're going to start uh, towards the end of this month, is a virtual celebration of the centenary of the attempts to build a state, uh, state in the Middle East. The first attempt to write a constitution for the entire Levant, including Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine. That attempt took place exactly 100 years ago, and we're going to reflect on the historical context and what happened within this 100 year, and how many of the contemporary issues uh, that are driving conflicts in the region relate to this issue of being always excluded, the people of the region always being excluded from state building, from the making of the constitution, the writing of the constitution, and the laws uh, of the countries. Uh, the order of the event today will be as follow. Uh, we're going to start with a, a short introduction by Dr. Bassam Haddad, and then we're going to show a trailer of the documentaries that they filmed in Baghdad uh, 17 years ago. Uh, and then uh, uh, Sinan Antoun will, will speak, we're going to show more clips, Bassam will come back and show you another clip uh, uh, from the documentary, and then we'll open it for questions and answers. You will see uh, on the right-hand side uh, uh, where you can put questions. If you want to speak, if you want to uh, speak your question, you can raise your hand and the moderator will give you the chance to speak. If not, you can just uh, type uh, uh, your question. So without further ado, I invite Dr. Sinan Anton to make his introduction. Dr. Bassam. Uh, sorry, Dr. Bassam had that. No, I think Bassam is, uh, was kicked out and is trying to get back. Yeah, he's back. Okay, Bassam is with us again. Excellent. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, Bassam, we can hear you. And now it's uh, uh, your turn to just tell us a few things about the documentary before we start the trailer. Well, I will say a little bit when I actually start uh, the, uh, the few minutes that I have separately. I just want to say that we were living in the United States witnessing the uh, run-up to the war and the mobilization that included government, a really uh, problematic and actually fraudulent government discourse with the media being completely complicit with it uh, about the necessity to strike uh, Iraq because of its involvement in 9-11, uh, because of WMDs and links to Al-Qaeda, all of which are were actually suspect uh, or not true. Uh, once the actual invasion took place, we decided to sort of um, uh, go and see for ourselves with a team that I'll, that I'll address in a minute. And the uh, documentary represents perhaps, uh, as we have been told, the first uh, team worldwide that actually entered Iraq, produced a documentary and released it uh, on what was happening in Baghdad and Iraq and uh, how Iraqis felt towards both the invasion uh, as well as uh, Saddam Hussein and uh, the situation in general. Great, thank you very much, uh, Bassam. So I'm gonna start with uh, the first clip out of the documentary now. Republics of Iraq, in which comes or beside chaos in Arabic Baghdad, English Baghdad, Dobri Otto, Dobri Din, Dobri Fido, Bansuar, Bandur, good morning.
تسجيل حاضر الله يساعدك عيني هاني سنان عراقي ترك في العراق بال91 كاتب جاهد. وطالب برا جاي نسوي فيلم وثائقي عن الوضع هسه نعم من وجهه نظر العراقيين نعم من مختلف الطبقات والطوائف وكذا احتلال بس من غصبا علينا لان الدكتاتور سقطاء من غصبا علينا احنا الاحتلال ما راضين بالاحتلال فاني اشوف الدبابه الامريكيه او المدرعه الامريكيه تمشي بالشارع كانه تمشي على قلبي اني شخصيا وكثير من العراقيين نفس الشيء حتى العرب هاي الدول العربيه مالت فلان قاعد تتفرج علينا شو حصلنا من عندهم فبس اريد لقاء بسيط وياك يعني تحكي براحتك بي على رايك ومشاعرك بالوضع بالصدام بالعقوبات بالحرب بالجنود هاي شلون كي ها يلا يلا خلص ابغداد لا هو سواك مدينة وما لي عن ام العراق وما لي عن ام العراق العراق وما بغداد لا هو سواك مدينة الشعب العراقي الشعب العراقي هذا شعب يعني ما ادري مع الاسف حمل جريرة ظلم الكرة الارضية كلها زين 35 سنة صار هذا الشعب يضرب ويضرب ويضرب وتحت المطرقة وماكو ماكو ما سمعنا صوت ما سمعنا صوت نادى بحقوقه ولا محفل اممي واجتماعي وانساني. So actually we are traumatized and those who have returned back from abroad are traumatized as well. They have been traumatized before leaving the country and they have been traumatized when they have returned to the country. It's like a Frankenstein, that's what I've been thinking. You know, this country has been chopped up by by dictatorship and then by sanctions and by war and now by occupation and now it's being it's stitched together in a very haphazard and ugly way and it's you know i don't know mali shughul bisuq marra tashufak مالي شغل بالسوق مريت اشوفك عطيشان حفنا سنين وارو على شوفك عطيشان حفنا سنين وارو Uh, I would like to welcome the people who joined us uh, while we were watching the first clip of the documentary. And I would like to remind everyone that this webinar is recorded and will be made public at our website, which I'm going to ch share with you now in the chat box. Uh, it will be made public after the event. So without further ado, I give the ground to uh, Sinan Anton. Thank you so much, Reem. Thanks for organizing this event. Um, I just want to share a few remarks about how we look at Iraq now and how we narrate the Iraq war, which are related actually to what Bassam said about why we made the film. And I think some of these dynamics about how Iraq is uh, misrepresented and how the history of its people is, is reduced are still uh, relevant today. Um, Beginnings and endings, or lack thereof, are of crucial importance if we are to understand the way history and its master narratives are constructed, or if we are to critically examine how events are strung in a certain order and how epochs are framed and what meanings are ascribed to their order. 
Uh, equally important are the strategies and tropes deployed to ensure the erasure and silence of other histories and narratives and to muffle the voices of those who once inhabited them or who could have. Histories that narrate their lives and deaths. Do wars come to an end? This is not a rhetorical question. They do end for the politicians and profiteers, for the pundits, for the perpetrators and participants in wars. Well, not all participants. Soldiers return with their own wounds, traumas, and ghosts, but I am more concerned with civilians. Civilians, we should always remember, do not choose to be in a war zone. Wars do not come to an end for civilians. They go on and are still ongoing in various visceral ways, whether in the lethal effects on their bodies and the bodies of their loved ones who lie in graves, in the scars on their bodies and their psyches, in the destruction of their homes and cities, of their social spaces and social fabric, in the obliteration of infrastructure and institutions that took decades to build, and this is really crucial in the Iraqi case, in the toxicity delivered by smart weapons in the environment and deposited for thousands of years to come, and in the genes of unborn humans, I am referring in this last sentence to the use of depleted uranium by the United States and its allies in 1991 and 2003, and the use of white phosphorus in Fallujah. When trying to measure the extent of the damage visited on Iraqi civilians, one infamous sentence always comes to mind. James Baker, the Secretary of State in the Bush, the Elders Administration, summed it all up back in 1991. Quote, we will return you to the pre-industrial age. The warning he delivered to Tariq Aziz, Iraq's foreign minister back then. The hubris and the barbarism in that statement is astounding. The daily bombing campaigns of the first Gulf War of 1991 started on January 17th and spread all over Iraq. The declared objective, of course, was to drive the occupying Iraqi army out of Kuwait, which it had invaded in August of 1990. But the bombing resulted in the destruction of Iraq's infrastructure. 134 bridges, 18 of Iraq's 20 power generating plants, industrial complexes, oil refineries, sewage pumping stations, and telecommunication facilities. Post-war electricity was reduced to 4% of pre-war levels. This is in 1991. The economic loss of the 43-day bombing campaign was estimated by UNICEF to be $232 billion. The American-led coalition dropped 88,000 tons of bombs. That is equivalent to seven Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. A few months later, on June 8th, a victory parade was held in Washington, D.C. to celebrate the end of Desert Storm. General Schwarzkopf joined Bush in the reviewing stand. But back in Iraq, another form of war went on. The economic sanctions that were imposed on Iraqis to force Iraq out of Kuwait in 1990 were kept in place despite their cruelty and devastating effects on all facets of life, and that they hurt the civilian population. Joy Gordon, in her excellent book, Invisible War, the United States and the Iraq Sanctions, mentions how a UN envoy described the situation in 1991 as, quote, near ap apocalyptic. The best estimate of excess child mortality, the number of children under five who died during the sanctions who would not have died under Iraq's economy and policy before sanctions is between 600 and 880,000. Every U.S. administration after Bush has bombed Iraq for one reason or another. Some of the same characters who oversaw the first Gulf War of 1991 made a comeback in the beginning of this century to sell and execute the 2003 war. Why are these dates and events important and worth revisiting? Because when Iraq or the Iraq war is mentioned, if ever, the narrative usually begins in 2003 and elides this longer history of destruction and war, or the quote-unquote involvement. The 2003 invasion, I keep saying and writing, was not the beginning. It was actually Act Three in a war that had started 12 years earlier and had continued unabated. The sanctions regime was war by other means, and some would say a more cruel war. In July, when we were filming this documentary, 
an Iraqi mother we interviewed told us, quote, I will forgive the Americans for bombing, but will not forgive them for the sanctions. There are many who say that they supported the 2003 war because of the intelligence that was provided and had they had the quote unquote correct information, they would have voted or opined otherwise. This is one of the many myths that are still uh, repeated today. We should remember that many of us, without being privy to or having access to intelligence reports, maintain that there would be no weapons of mass destruction. A country that had been so devastated and besieged and whose economy uh, was degraded after being subjected to the most cruel sanctions regime in history would not have the capacity to manufacture WMDs. One need not be a genius to figure that out. Many of us warned that the invasion and war would not only devastate Iraq, but would bring further disaster to the region. 500 Iraqis in the diaspora, including myself, of various ethnic and political backgrounds, many of whom were dissidents and victims of Saddam's regime, signed a petition entitled No to War, No to Dictatorship. While condemning Saddam's reign of terror, we were against, quote, a war that would cause more death and suffering for innocent Iraqis and one that threatened to push the entire region into violent chaos. Quote, end of quote. Our voices, of course, were not welcomed in mainstream media in the United States or elsewhere which preferred the pro-war Iraqi-American neocon who promised cheering crowds that would welcome invaders with sweets and flowers. There were none, of course. In the autumn of 2004, uh, sorry, the chief U.S. arms inspector for Iraq, Charles Dulfer, came forth with a definitive report that confirmed that Saddam Hussein had possessed no stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction and no active weapons program. There were no weapons of mass destruction, there was no Al-Qaeda link. The brutal dictatorship in Iraq was removed, yes, but so was the Iraqi state itself and all of its institutions. And you know about the chaos and the violence that was unleashed by the invasion. Despite the catastrophic effects of the invasion and the wars, there was never a serious critical debate in the United States about it. Aside from using withdrawal or ending the war as a slogan and campaign promise, there has been no accountability or responsibility whatsoever, nor is there a genuine desire or serious effort to acknowledge the crimes and horrors visited on Iraqis. The reductive language used by the ruling elite and their pundits and scribes when the Iraq war is mentioned in passing is that it was, quote, a blunder or a mistake. This is an, insistent, an instance of the effective erasure of the past. If there is any sense of regret at all, it only extends to the loss of American lives, of course, or to taxpayer dollars, as if the destruction of an entire country was a bad investment or a gamble. The pundits and scribes who played their dutiful part in the government's war chorus in the run-up to the war are still out there dispensing wisdom ad infinitum. And by the way, lest we forget, many of those who supported the war were not from the right or your usual neocons, but did so from the elite liberal platforms. For example, the New Yorker's David Remnick wrote, quote, history will not easily excuse us if by deciding not to decide, we defer a reckoning with an aggressive totalitarian leader who intends not only to develop weapons of mass destruction, but also to use them. A return to a hollow pursuit of containment will be the most dangerous option of all. End of quote. The architects of the war have been fully rehabilitated and appear in public and on popular TV shows without a single critical question or protest about their past misdeeds. One prime example, of course, is George Bush dancing with Ellen DeGeneres on her show. Another is when he handed over a mint to former First Lady Michelle Obama at Senator John McCain's funeral. That act warmed the hearts of Beltway folks and other citizens who in the Trump era are nostalgic for a time when America was somehow less polarized and more humane, or so they think. Tony Morrison once wrote that, quote, the past is absent or it's romanticized. This culture doesn't encourage dwelling on, let alone coming to terms with the truth about the past. With a few exceptions, this is still the case. 
And of course, the uprising that is taking part in the United States now is partly against all of this amnesia, which is pervasive except for a few pockets in the left. So much so for material vi violence, I have been thinking in recent years about epistemic and discursive violence, and the two are not mutually exclusive. One could argue that in the Iraqi context, a form of epistemic violence was already being perpetrated against Iraqis during the sanctions, which isolated Iraq from the world, deprived its citizens from access to knowledge and resources. If that is debatable, there is no doubt that 2003 marked the beginning of the institutionalization and dissemination of various forms of epistemic violence in Iraq by the occupation and the political system it designed and put in place. The imposition of discourses through which the sense of Iraqiness and national belonging is fractured and fragmented, and Iraqis are encouraged to see themselves as members of sects first and foremost. This is actually where the uprising that took place in Iraq in October of last year and continued is such an important uh, development on so many fronts. After the US invasion, many Iraqi professional groups, syndicates, and secular parties began mobilizing, but were purposely excluded from the political process. Actually, when we were filming the documentary, we visited one such Congress where a lot of independent non-sectarian parties were meeting in Baghdad, but of course they were never given a voice in the new system. U.S. policies encouraged the secular to become sectarian so as to be included in the emerging political system. Um, the massive protests that erupted in Baghdad and other cities in Iraq on the first day of October, which later evolved into a full-fledged revolt that had spread throughout the country, as I said, is a unique and monumental event in the country's history because it's the beginning of the reversal of the actual destruction and the epistemic violence that was perpetrated in 2003. The outbreak of these protests was neither surprising nor unprecedented. Back in 2011, the tide of Arab revolts that swept Tunisia, Egypt, and Syria reached Iraq, and it had its own day of rage. But the massive protests that broke out that year in Iraq were quashed by the authorities. In recent years, protests against massive corruption, unemployment, and failing services have become almost seasonal, particularly in the scorching summer months when electricity shortages and lack of sufficient potable water exacerbate an already angry citizenry. Seething with anger, Iraqis in Baghdad and other cities take to the streets to voice various demands. The protests are suppressed and eventually dissipate and or are hijacked by this or that political force. Promises of reform from the government follow every time. Um, while not surprising, October's protests were markedly different from those of previous years in several respects. Unlike previous ones, this, was, this wave was totally spontaneous. It did not come in response to a call from, nor was it organized by any party or group of activists. The sense of despair and disappointment the protesters felt and their desire to reclaim Iraq was crystallized in one of their main chants. We want a homeland. Most of these protesters are young Iraqis who came of age in the wake of the Anglo-American invasion the invasion toppled Saddam Hussein's regime, but it also dismantled, as I said, the Iraqi state and its institutions, dictated a flawed constitution, installed a sectarian-based dysfunctional system, and populated it with parties and politicians, many of whom were allies, if not pawns, of the US, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, and the UK, since this event is taking case in, place in the UK. The so-called political process, mischaracterized as a democracy by Western pundits and journalists, has cobbled together a failed state that is incapable of providing the minimum prerequisites for a dignified life for average Iraqis. The country's vast oil revenues are cannibalized by massive corruption and feed a voracious oligarchy with transnational partners while leaving millions hungry and humiliated. According to Transparency International's Corruption Index, Iraq is the world's 12th most corrupt country. It was once the most corrupt country in the world. 
Perhaps this is why some Western journalists have started to write stories about the improvement in Iraq in recent years. A total of $600 billion of public funds has evaporated since 2003. These young protesters have lived under this system their entire lives and incurred the heaviest of losses. Iraqis, like others in various countries in the world and in the region, are not only victims, they are agents of change and women and men making, quote, their own history. But of course, they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already given and transmitted from the past. One of the many aspects that are that were so encouraging and inspiring for so many Iraqis inside Iraq and in the diaspora is how these protests were reclaiming and articulating a new sense of national belonging that was eroding under dictatorship and had begun to be destroyed under the sectarian political system that the US put in place. I will stop here and we can talk more about this later yeah. after the clips and the Q&A. Great, thank you very much uh, Sinan for a very moving account of what happened in Iraq since uh, the invasion. Uh, we're going to share now a new clip uh, from about Baghdad documentary before uh, going to uh, uh, Dr. Bassam Haddad. ارررون <تصفيق> مجرد انت تنطي رايك على صدام حسين تنعدم هم ما يدوا استقرار ما يدوك تستقر ما يدوك تعيش لان يعني دا ينهبوك دا يبوقوك قنينا غاز احنا بلد انتاجي نفطي 15000 غاز ماكو فازين ما عندنا كهرباء ما عندنا ما يقطعوا علينا المحطات انت فوق بيوتنا ضربة عمارة ليش شو مسوي لهم احنا مو قايلين احنا جايين بسلام مو جاي نخلصكم من الحجر اللي تجدوا هذا مو مطاضيكم سوونا مو بس هذا حتى العرب هاي الدول العربية ما تاكلها قاعد تتفرج علينا شو حصلنا من عندنا الاف العراقيين او بالمئات الالوف مدفونين احياء هم ما حد حكى من الصحافه العربيه من الاقلام العربيه ما قالوا صدام حسين دفن مئات الالوف من العرب من العراقيين عربا واكرادا اندفنوا في في مقابر جماعيه ما حد حكى فيه بالنسبه للدول العربيه اذا اسمح لي اول شيء الدول العربيه ناس جشعين وطماعين وقاعدين بس مجرد على الكراسي ما عندهم لا عروبه ولا عندهم غير على العربيه ولا عندهم وطنيه هاي ترى كلها شعارات وكلاوات مجرد يضحكون على المواطن العربي المواطن العربي وشارع العام هو اللي يحكي ويعبر عن الاخوه والعلاقه ما بين العرب ولكن القاده العرب كلهم غير صالحين وليس قائدين الى هاي العروبه نحسب نفسنا ان نشوف واحد يطالب رحيل امريكان، ليش رحيل امريكان؟ هو من حرر العراق غير امريكان؟ حررنا من صدام حسين، دول العربيه اللي كانوا ياخذون فلوسنا يقولون الامريكان جاي ياخذوا فلوس العراقيين، لا هذا كذب. حتى اذا اخذوا 50% نعم الله 50% يبقى لنا، صدام حسين جاي ياخذ 95% له 5% ينطر شعب العراقي. الجنوب هسه لا نفط، لا غاز، لا بنزين. جنوب <تصفيق> 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 <ت
انا البارحه سلفت سكينه بيدي عربية وهاي راسه ضربه هنا في المدينه وكسره وفتشي وحتى الغالي قدام 110000 في الشارع في الشارع العربي الامان بس الامان بس انتم ما نريد لا امريكا ولا غير امريكا نريد الامان في الشارع العام عندي مشكله انا عندي مشكله الان اعاني منها اسمها بطاله شغل الشعب العراقي ماكو سرقات البطاله تشرب ليش توضح هذا الشيء اخي التحالف التحالف اجى بالدبابات ب 24 ساعه التحالف ما يقدر يجيب ويا بواخر بها مولدات كهربائيه Uh, thank you again for uh, being with us after uh, uh, this clip, which I'm sorry, there was some technical problem. There was some delay between the sound and image and part of the clip. But we're going to make all these clips available uh, for public after the event, and we're going to send you all the links. Uh, <clears throat> without further ado, I give the ground now to Dr. Bassam Haddad, <clears throat> who is the executive director of the Arab Studies Institute, which is a co-organizer of this event. Bassam, the floor is yours. Bassam, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. I couldn't earlier. Okay, so the floor, the floor is yours, Bassam. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, well, again, thanks, Reem, and uh, everyone for inviting uh, me to join this webinar, Me and Sinan. Uh, this is very much a, uh, an opportunity to also uh, remember, not just to uh, analyze and pontificate, uh, we uh, are in a context that calls for this remembrance and calls for the erasure of amnesia, if this is possible. I'd like to start by sharing, again, that what happened in Iraq um, and to Iraq since uh, the early 1980s has been gruesome, at least. Wars, invasions, sanctions, and endless violence has shattered, had shattered the country and its uh, social fabric and rendered it unrecognizable to those who knew it prior to the onset of these calamities. I am afraid something similar is happening today to Syria and for the past years. Both were ruled by brutal dictatorships or are, in the case of Syria, for decades, and both experienced various forms of international military interventions. That of 2003 in Iraq uh, was the most destabilizing and destructive in the Iraqi case. Much has been said about the American invasion of 2003 and Sinan also discussed some of these matters. I will try to be as brief as I can so we can get to the other clips and discussion of uh, the uh, film and its consequences or the consequences of what the film was about. Uh, so much has been discussed about the war in 2003 being fraudulent, based on false premise, brutal, barbaric, and so on. And they are all true, by the way. But perhaps most consequential beyond the human misery and chaos it caused, generated and unleashed, is that the 2003 invasion was a sort of a big bang that had ripple effects both in space and time, from which the people of Iraq and the region continue to suffer. For instance, we cannot divorce the developments in the Syrian uprising and war from the consequences of the Iraqi context, and we can discuss this a bit later on. When we set out to go to Iraq in 2003, uh, about a month or so after the invasion, with a team of brave people that included Maya Magdashi, Adam Shapiro, Susie Salami, and of course Sinan and myself, I had actually been teaching a course, a graduate course at Georgetown University uh, on the politics of Iraq and Syria. And of course, Sinan knew Baghdad and Iraq inside out. We did not know exactly what to expect, but we were able to anticipate and adapt to how the invasion had changed the landscape and animated the responses to it. Now, many of us forget the important details, some of which Sinan pointed to, and it is important not to, uh, it's important to do so, because there seems to be more to come in terms of how war was and is sold to the publics of uh, seemingly very powerful states. Primarily, back in the United States, it was shocking how the majority of the public was moved to believe within a few short months 
that Iraq and its leadership not only had uh, ready to fire WMDs and had intricate connections with Al Qaeda, but that all, but also that Saddam Hussein had a hand, a direct hand in the 9/11 attacks. In the summer of 2002, the American public, based on polls and surveys that are now accessible on the internet and beyond, most of the public thought of Saddam Hussein as another brutal dictator who committed crimes against his own people and so on, all true. Incidentally, not many focused on the US patronage of the Iraqi regime and the Iran-Iraq war and beyond, but that's another story. The point is that between summer of 2002 and March of 2003, when the invasion took place, polls showed that more than 65 to 75 percent, depending on the poll and the wording, of Americans believed that Saddam Hussein had a connection to 9-11, a totally illegitimate assertion. The point was that government, or the point is and was, that government and media, uh, private media, mind you, as well uh, as uh, their, uh, you know, uh, connections with uh, various firms and various material interests, both literally conspired to create uh, this and other connections to justify a brutal invasion of a regime and population that had been under 13 years of the most devastating sanctions imposed on, a, on any population after World War II. We lived in the United States and experienced this theatrical process and tried to counter it without ever absolving the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein and its many atrocities. But the appetite of superpowers and their attendant business and material opportunities, as well as their ability to manipulate a supposedly sophisticated democratic public, triumphed over all reason and humanity. So we headed to Iraq in uh, June, July 2003. Ever since, one of our fears has been that this pattern will continue as it has, even if in lesser ways, the pattern of uh, trying to come up with various uh, contexts to justify wars and invasions. And Iraq burned in more than one way for years. The uprisings that erupted in the region in 2011 and later in 2019 in Sudan, Algeria, Lebanon, and Iraq are not a positive consequence of the liberation of Iraq. On the contrary, they represent, they represent a rejection of dictatorship as well as its supporters and bankrollers, where the United States takes the biggest credit for playing the most dominant and consistent role based on its support of such regimes for decades since World War II, until today, of course. Finally, and of course, we can talk about the uh, competition by earlier the Soviet Union and now Russia, but it actually does not rise up to the level of U.S. support for dictatorship today in the region and beyond. Finally, what we are witnessing in Iraq today and for the past months is an uprising against the remnants of the U.S. invasion against a corrupt government, against the meddling of Iran and its minions in the country, and we, uh, in many ways, uh, are witnessing the agency of Iraqis that was robbed by dictatorship and invasion and now is being reclaimed by brave Iraqi men and women on the streets. Um, there are other things I would like to address, but I would like to go back to our uh, discussion of the film clips and use that as a launching pad for more discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Bassam, and thank you for being on time. So we're gonna show another clip uh, in which you appear, actually, from about Baghdad, and then another a third clip, and after that, we'll open the floor for questions and answer uh, about your presentation about the and about the content of the documentary itself. الحصار اللي السيارات كان كان محدود ضيق وشو كان هسه بالعكس هسه مفتوح هسه التاجر العراقي حسب ما هو حسب ما يشوف المتطلبات الحاجه الشعب العراقي اللي يريدها يروح يستوردها راسا بدون بدون اجازه من كل من كل العالم يستورد الشعب معه فلوس يدفع له موجود فلوس الحمد لله رحمه الله لوالدات من موجوده موجود دولار موجود كثره كميات هاي ياخذ رواتب بالدولار هلا مين عم ياخذ رواتب؟ كل الموظفين بالدوله قاعد تاخذ بالدولار كل الموظفين البطاله البطاله موجوده موجوده بطاله بس مو مو ذيك الكميات الكبيره الناس بعد 70% بطاله 
70%؟ اي وانا في 70% لا لا مو 70 نص ما اخذ ماكو ماكو 40% ماكو يعني نص نص اي بس بس حبيبي اي اي عائله بيها بطاله بنسبه معينه بس اكو مقابيلها نفس العائله يشتغلون هي بعد الضربه بعد ما دخلوا الامريكان كل قام تشتغل لان قام تتوفر المواد الاوليه راسا يعني انتم كقطاع خاص طرحانين طبعا انا شخصيا انا بالنسبه لي كرئيس غرفه يعني هواي مرتاح من جوله من الكلام بس انت برايك القطاع الخاص حيقدر يوظف عماله مثل ما كان يوظف العام اكثر 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 يعني هسه كل دول العالم تصدر بضائع الى امريكا بكوتا الدوله الوحيده بدون كوتا هو العراق هسه فانا بكره اذا شغلت المصنع مالتي حصدر كل انتاجي الى امريكا والاسعار تقريبا طيب. اريدها طيب كيف عم تشتغل هالمعامل اذا الكهرباء مش متوفره اذا المي مش متوفره أكو أكو اذا البنيه التحتيه مش متوفره اسمح لي اسمح لي الكهر... الكهرباء صح مو متوفره بس المي موجود المي صح يتقطع بس ممكن اخذها متوفر المي بقى الكهرباء الكهرباء اجيب اجيب مولدات اجيب مولدات واستشرف موجوده يعني ممكن تصحح يعني الحمد لله كل شيء تمام بالعراق هسه هسه احنا اذا تسمح لي اذا تسمح لي هسه احنا كل شيء ماكو شلون مش دخلي مواطن ده يسال شو اسمه صحفي ده يسال واجاب انا ده يسال وجهه نظر الكل اي وجهة نظر الكل نعم ليش؟ انا مخلص معك ممتاز نحكي معك معلش فينا نحكي معك بعد ما نخلص فيك تستنى فيك تستنى بعدين نحكي معك يعني هلا وفيك طب معلش لكن هذا الرجل هذا الرجل ترى ترى ما ما اعرفه لا لا بالغرفه ولا كل شيء وما لي علاقه بالغرفه بس ما ما نعرف ما ما نعرف انت منو خلي 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 بجيب على الغرفه خلي بجيب فين جاي انا جيني وجنبك من الشارع اه من الشارع الغرفه حاليا بدها تقبض رسوم رسوم يوميه 6 ملايين لا شبابيك لا جام لا كهرباء لا تنظيم كهرباء ماكو بالبلد مي ماكو بالبلد بطاله موجوده البطاله هواي فوق ال 70% هو قال لك 50% لا 80% بطاله وساعه ب 12 بالوحده تعزل سيارة شارع الرشيد يعزل يورو موجود تسليب موجود يوميا 4 5 قتله بالشارع يعني هذا مو حقائق هم اللي يحكوها خلي يحكون الحقائق للبلد كان الوضع يعني وضع صدام حسين مو خوش وضع تمام مضطهدين احنا كعراقيين بس اكو استقرار اكو امن اكو نومه راحه للعمل موجود والتجاره موجوده بس مو نظاميه يعني بس الربعه منين انتم فين كل وقت ها منين انتم خلينا نتعرف عليكم انا انا من الصومال شرقت معرفه خبر لا صعد انا من الصومال يلوق لك عارف من الصومال ايش هذا الله مستني من جيبوتي عقلك شكل جيبوتي انا جديد هذا الملك فيصل فيصل الاول هذا انت تريد ترجع الملكيه لا ولا شد شد خرجت انت انا تربيه كيمي سويت وراها بزت خدمة عسكرية ورا مال الكويت مباشرة خشيت عسكرية سنة ونص وبعدين سنة ونص صارت سنتين لأن ماكو تسريع بعدين أعمال حرة زين هسه شنو شو رأيك بعد كل اللي صار؟ والله شنو شنو؟ شعوري؟ بعد اللي صار هسه بعد سقوط النظام والاحتلال وكذا اللي ماكو احتلال أنا بالنسبة لي ما أعتبر هذا احتلال احتلال شو تسميه؟ الأمريكان بأي حال من الأحوال أصحاب فضل علينا شلون؟ مجرد خلصونا من صدام حسين اصحاب فضل بس هذول هذول الامريكان هم بالثمانينات هم كانوا يوطون صدام اسلحه و ايوه ايوه رجال اندولر عليهم وقال من قال بال90 من قال غدر الغادرين هم كانوا اتفقوا وياهم انقلب عليهم زين شلون هذول اصحاب فضل علينا لما هم كانوا يساعدوا ويضربنا على راسنا هم هم اللي جابوا هم اللي اختلفوا وياه هم اللي طلعوه اسلوب الاستعمار ابن عمي تغير، الامريكان لا تتوقع انهم ممكن انه يظلون هذا جيشهم وهذا كذا وهذا وضعيتهم. تتبدل حكومه تجي حكومه نوعا ما مواليه، يعني بالنسبه لي ثلاث ارباع الشعب العراقي بوسيده وتشوفوا يعني ما راح يتغير، انا خايف انه ما راح يتغير هوايه. اذا ما تغير هوايه فانا لله وانا اليه راجعون، واذا راح يتغير شويه فاحنا على الاقل راح نقوم قانوعين بهل شويه هاي اللي حصلناه شنو على الاقل على اللي سوينا المذابح تبقى نفس الوضعيه مال قبل شويه احسن غير 
بس انه تعيش براحتك مو؟ تلو ايش طلعت بال91؟ طلعت لانه هو البلد كان سجن على خير خلي يصير يروح السجن هذا يعني انا في يوم من الايام ما بقيت ما كفرت والله بسبب شنو شرطي وقفني اوكي اوف الحج كله او جد لي حل انت ثاني حتى انا اذا ما عندي حل ثاني مو معناه مو دقيقه مو معناه ليس بالامكان احسن مما كان اقول لك هذا الشيء سمعت عن المقابر الجماعيه سمعت هوايه وكذبت عني عنها هوايه لقوا بها امراه ويا طفل رضيع عمره عده اسابيع بحيث باللي يعني انا بدي اقراها قمت ابكي بوقتها يقول وكانها اختارت انه تقابل الله هي وهذا الطفل اللي بينه وبينها فقط الدجداشه مالتها حاضرته ميته هي وياه طفل رضيع صحيح بس تدري لي هاي يعني اذا نبها يمن هذه ما عاد ذنب بس خليني اقول لك هاي المقابر النظام هو اللي قبرهم تمام تدري اكثريتها سواها بال91 ليش صارت هاي المقابر بال91 لانه بوش ابو هذا البوش قال على الشعب العراقي الان ان ياخذ الامور بزمام يديه طلعت الانتفاضه شهر شعبان ثاروا الناس تذكر تشت هنا 16 محافظه دقيقه ما ايه. كان بيها نظام ايه سكت وحتى انا هنا بغداد شفت يسقط صدام بس وقعوا وقف اطلاق النار سبحان الله صدام يستخدم السمتيات فهم صدام انه الامريكان هم يريدوه هو يبقى بس ما يريدون الات العسكريه وبطش وذبح وحط هذول كلهم مقابر جماعيه اذا صحيح مسؤوليه بالدرجه الاولى صدام بس امريكا مو هي هي اللي وفرت له الادوات انه يسوي هذا زين هو بالثمانينات لما كان يذبح ويذبح بالمئات الالاف ليش ما قالوا شيء عنه؟ احنا كشعب عراقي المسؤول عنه من هو بوش لصدام حسين؟ احنا مسؤولين عن نفسنا بس اذا يجي واحد هسه يقول انا ما من حقي انه اجي اقعد احاسب الامريكي جورج بوش قال ما من حقي انه احاسب انا رئيسي صحيح. اللي هو اكثر من 20 سنه رئيسي تمام هسه يجي واحد هنا يهجم علينا انا وانت يضربنا بسكينه زين اكو هناك واحد اقوى منه بهوايه وهو مطي سكينه هذاك مو مسؤول ايضا جزئيا؟ اكيد هذا ف... هذا هاي صدام احنا ما راح يضربنا بسكينه راح نروح نضرب ذاك ونصيحه تعال لا نقعد ندافع روحنا وياه هذا لا بس هذاك اللي طاس سكينه لما يقول انا تهمني حريتكم إيه؟ وتهمني سعادتكم لازم نقول له وين كنت انت لما كانت السكاكين تنزل علينا مطر وين كنتوا انتم؟ انت لو لو هاي العشر سنين الاخيره بالذات او 12 سنه الاخيره بالذات كنت موجود هنا ببغداد فيك واعتقد تقول ما يخالف خليجي عزرائيلي يقعد هنا يمي اخر من صدام حسين. لا تتوقع انه هو سنه او سنتين ممكن انه اذا ظلوا الامريكان او اجتي ظلت هاي ال 24 الشخص او اللجنه الحاكمه هسه او الشخص الايد اللي قالها مواني انه راح يظلون العراقيين ساكتين لا. العراقيين هاي طبعهم خشمهم يابس ما راح يرضون الاستعمار ما ممكن. قدامهم فلسطين مثال وقدامهم اكثر من مثال. زين انت اي نوع حكم تريد تشوف؟ شريد اي حكم يعني ملكي لا ما ممكن لا 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 جمهوري علماني لا جمهوري ديمقراطي ما يريد هم شغله انه يجون الشيعه وما شيعه انا مع العلم انه هون شيعه ما يريد لا شيعه ولا غير شو لك سو ثانك يو ايفري ون اجين اي انفايت بسام اند سينان تو بي وذ اس اجين تيرن يور مايكس اون اند وي اوبن ذا فلور ناو فور كويشنز اجين Now, if you would like to speak, you can make a request to speak, and uh, our session moderator will uh, give you the turn to speak. Uh, and but you can also type uh, your questions in the question and uh, uh, answer box. So, uh, Adnan, now moderating the event in the background, would you like to give the first um, uh, hand up the opportunity to speak, Adnan? Uh, no, I can't hear anything. While we're waiting for the questions, uh, but some of the Sinan, there is already a written question here from Amal Al Jabul. She's asking, um, she's saying, saying, Thank you for the brilliant historical moments you captured in your film. Uh, is it possible, please, to screen, screen it in Baghdad and how can we get access to the documentary?
Yeah, I mean, we, I, we, we would love to, of course. I think we're, the Sam is going to speak about our plans to uh, re-release the film soon, and um, it's not easy to organize these kinds of events in, in Baghdad, but definitely. I mean, it was already, a lot of friends and a lot of uh, folks have already seen the film in, in Iraq, but we would love to uh, organize screenings in the Baghdad and in neighboring countries especially around the 20th anniversary, I think. Sam, do you want to say something about uh, releasing the film in a few months? Yes, we, uh, we actually uh, wanted to do it on... Uh, <coughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. We wanted to do it on uh, March uh, 20th or 21st, the anniversary of the invasion, but because of the... Uh, uh, closures we we couldn't actually get things uh out so we are waiting until uh, life goes back to normal so that we could uh, uh, produce a, a cleaner version of what you have seen from the original files and make it open access so look out for the release of an open access version of the film uh pretty soon and and uh we uh, uh are fortunate uh, to have been able to do uh to do what we did to make this film and as you have seen uh a lot of what has been said in the film uh by all parties are things that uh continue to 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 linger with us uh directly or indirectly whether in the region or in terms of what is happening here where i'm at and where sinan is at in the united states vis-a-vis -vis the region uh, thank you. Uh, we have also a question from Ian Hanna that says, how did sectarianism evolve in Iraq since the invasion of 2003? Are we in the uh, or lost place in terms of the relation between sectarian groups? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear your question. The question... Uh, uh, okay, is it... Uh, I don't know if you see it in the question box, Sinan. From Ian Hanna oh. says, how has the sectarianism evolved in Iraq since the invasion of 2003, and are we in yeah. a better or worse place in terms of the relation between the different sectarian groups? Yeah, I mean, look, the question of, of uh, sectarianism and political sectarianism is very complicated, and one cannot do it justice in five or even 50 minutes. Um, so, but one thing to remember is what is, uh, as I mentioned, that the slogans that were raised in this last uprising show that an increasing number of Iraqis, especially amongst the youth, have realized the, that the sectarian discourse has completely expired, and many of them have realized that it was merely a, a political tool, of course. I mean, in, in previous years, the, the main slogan was Bismiddin Bagon al harami in the name of religion, the thieves have, have swindled us. So I think you know it's it's important to understand sectarianism, but but much of the of the of the problems in viewing Iraq is only to view it in terms of sectarianism and sectarian groups. There is an obsession with, and there was, and there still is, of speaking of Iraqs only in terms of sects and sectarianism. Sectarianism exists everywhere, and it changes. That's all I'll, I'll say here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there are two questions now. One from Andy Salmon. He's asking whether uh, the film also captured the views after 2003. And we have a question from uh, Muna Winter, who is saying uh, she would like to hear more on the current and how it has been unfolding during the conflict and other organizational leadership challenges. Sorry, again, I couldn't hear the question very there is, well. There is some feedback, uh, Reem, uh, when you are yeah. speaking, there's some feedback somewhere. Okay, but uh, are you able to see the question now? The question of the services, you, can, you will be able to read In the, I don't see in the chat. Okay, I think, okay, I'm going to read it again. Uh, maybe one of you need to close your mic because there is an echo. So the question is like, if you would, uh, Mona would like to hear more your thoughts on the current intifada and how it has been unfolding during the current pandemic onset 
and other organizational and leadership challenges involved. Also, we have a question from Andy Salmon, who's asking where the film captured the views of the whether the film captured the views of what sort? After, after 2003. Um. Uh, just one note, uh, right now when we changed the views, there was a fourth camera that was creating a weakness of the signal. Now that we're back to three, it's completely clear. Uh, in, just in case this helps for the rest of the event. Um, I mean, if I understood the, the question correctly, we filmed in July. We had, you know, very limited resources, by the way. And we had very limited time. Ideally, we'd have liked to go all over Iraq, but we were only restricted to Baghdad. We um, tried very hard to give um, an idea of the spectrum of Iraqi views and you know to speak to people from different ideological positions from different classes and so on and so forth and as you saw with the cab driver and with others we included a lot of opinions that we did not necessarily um, agree with now uh, so many of the dynamics that are shown in the film uh, are still there in iraq in a way the corruption that we could already see the beginnings of the chaos of the occupation and the way a lot of Iraqis feel about exiled diaspora politicians who have not been in the country for 30 years coming to rule uh, the country. But of course, we were also lucky in that when we were in Baghdad in July, we were able to relatively move around the city uh, safely. A few weeks after we left uh, the terrorism and the car bombs and the suicide bombings started, which then made, of course, changed a lot of things and made it very difficult, of course, to, to move around and speak to Iraqis. But we had, if I may say so, to toot our horn, we're still one of the few documentaries where Iraqis speaks for themselves and it's about them. Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I, and the current intifada, again, it's evolving and things have changed so much in the last three months because of COVID and because of what what's been happening and because of all the intricate changes and the attempts of the regime and the various parties to disorient the intifada, to buy off a lot of people. And some people are pessimistic, of course, but I and many others contend that the basic material reality that pushed hundreds of thousands of Iraqis to protest is still there. This new government is not really going to change anything on the ground, whether it has to do with electricity, whether it has to do with services, and actually Iraq's economic problems are mounting. So the reasons that pushed people to go out and protest are still there. And as we've seen from other countries, there are waves, there is ebb and there is flow. And there are millions of young Iraqis who want a better future and want a new country and they're not gonna go anywhere else. They're gonna go out and they're going to protest. And of course, I'm not naive in that the regime and its supporters and the regional uh, powers that back it are brutal and lethal. So it's a long battle between people who believe in Iraq for all of its citizens and militias that are uh, beholden to Iran and other parties that are beholden to other countries or to the United States. But I just wanted to say that the important thing about this last clip, I think, is to show some of the dynamics and why citizens living under dictatorship and sanctions are so humiliated and drained that they are willing, as the cab driver said, to accept that the angel of death would come uh, because they are willing to wager on that. This is something very important to understand, especially in these days when sanctions are being imposed on the Syrian regime that are going to hurt Syrian citizens and are not going to weaken the regime. So a lot of the dynamics that, that the speakers in the film address are still with us in the region, whether in Iraq or Syria or elsewhere. Great, thank you. Uh, Sinan, we have uh, more questions. So uh, one of them from Sunny Singh, who's asking, uh, whether you see any similarities between the current Iraqi situation and the Cold War hotspots such as Vietnam, Korea, Germany, 
or are there any other additional factors? There is also a question from uh, Mohammed Dawani who's saying what strategy should Iraq adopt regarding its Arab and non-Arab neighbors? Bassam. Bassam, would you like to answer? I, I was sorry, I was speaking on mute. Uh, there's also a question from Facebook that I sent to the chat and to the admin from Facebook's, uh, from Jadaria's Facebook feed, uh, if you can access it also, because it's, it seems uh, quite pertinent. Uh, yes, sir, if you would like to read some of these questions and answer them, that would be great. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read the question and then I'll leave it up to um, uh, Sinan, because this is uh, mainly for uh, Sinan. Uh, well, some nice words about the presentations and then, um, what are the spaces you are finding, this is for Sinan, what are the spaces that you are finding interesting to study the trauma, violence, and grief, uh, the communal, the individual, uh, public versus private, basically something that, that I think Sinan can address uh, aptly. Can you start with that, Sinan? Do you mind? I mean, that's an excellent question, but I don't think I have a, um, a full answer. And that part of what I didn't have time to address is that the part of the epistemic violence is strangling and suffocating Iraqis inside because of everything, because of the civil war, because of the destruction, because of the lack of any institutions, so that it, you know, there aren't that many spaces and places for Iraqis to address all of this also because there has been a deluge of problems from the occupation to sectarian violence to ISIS and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I look for it in, in social media. I look for it in what Iraqis inside write uh, on their Facebook pages or share elsewhere. And of course, there are a lot of people who are beginning to write a lot of these things. But of course, one other effect uh, of not being able or having very little access is that for the longest time it was so difficult to, to, to visit Iraq or so dangerous for so many. But also, you know, part of the degradation of, of Iraqi institutions that started out, it started out with dictatorship, but of course uh, was accentuated, accentuated during the sanctions is what happened to the educational system and all of that. So I don't know where, where to begin with. It's very difficult and this problem, I think, extends to the region itself and we are having all of the uh, crises that we have with print journalism and so on and so forth. So, so many platform and spaces are disappearing already, but there are a lot of initiatives uh, on the part of a lot of young people to create spaces where they would address the previous traumas and address all of these issues. There isn't a very uh, simple or organized way of finding out all of these things. This is one of the many things that we need to organize and we need to archive, but in the absence of a functioning state, in the absence of institutions and funding for institutions inside, what is left is what is left to some NGOs and some of them are very problematic because they are funded by external sources with their own agendas. So it's, I'm pessimistic in that respect. Uh, I can I can address the uh, Cold War and the Vietnam question if you sure uh, thank you. before we move on okay so uh, I mean the desire of superpowers to dominate and exploit is a running theme uh, in any epoch uh, what distinguishes this uh, these two or several examples that the questioner asked about is that the uh, first set of uh, cases. Korea, Vietnam, and so on, occurred under within the context of the uh, Cold War. And they represented a battle, a global battle, uh, in which various, in which these two superpowers, the United States and Soviet Union, were vying for control. In the case of Iraq, we had pretty much a unipolar world where the United States was dominant, not only in terms of its military power and economic control, but also uh, in uh, in some ideological terms, 
uh, it's at least assumed to have reached the end of history or at least uh, seem to uh, have thought in terms of at least the, the discourse in government and so on, that uh, we have reached some sort of uh, ideal state. And that uh, provided a number of uh, uh, circles of power in the United States with the impetus to uh, secure its domination and its way of doing things locally and globally for the decades for decades to come, which is precisely what happened directly after 9-11 with the response from uh, this cabal of people, whereby uh, we have a note from Rumsfeld in the response to 9-11 that basically said, sweep it all up, let's basically use this opportunity to do a lot more than just respond to this uh, disaster and, and this, this uh, uh, crime that took place in 9-11. And the case uh, of Iraq is additionally problematic because we are looking at a, we're, you know, at a case, a country, a regime, a dictator that was very much a, uh, a client of the uh, patron, which is the U.S., for many years in the 1980s. And in many ways, it, it, it represents uh, how the uh, workings of power basically uh, ultimately are in search for domination and exploitation under any circumstance, which of course uh, happened when Iraq uh, and Saddam Hussein uh, basically tried to get out of the grip of the United States, or at least he didn't think he was doing that in 1991 when he thought it is okay to invade Kuwait and so on. So, so we, we have two different contexts, but the theme, the narrative that uh, is before us continues to be the same. And it actually now is, uh, we are witnessing a continuation of the same narrative and the same desire to exploit and dominate vis-a-vis -vis the question of Iran. Uh, whether or not there are differences between the administrations, there is a, uh, a current attempt to uh, drum up support for some sort of uh, escalation regarding Iran, except that the positive development since 2003 is that the American public's appetite, not just the military appetite and the idea that the military stretched too thin and so on, but the American public's appetite vis-a-vis -vis external wars has diminished considerably. And their suspicion, our suspicion, people here in the United States, our suspicion of plans to actually execute such uh, 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 invasions or, or actions uh, it has, has been heightened. And at the same time, which is, I think, a positive development. The pie, the global pie of power worldwide has been divided in more ways than it was in 2003, 4, 5, and 6 uh, in a manner that actually can hold the U.S. in check. So we have a few positive things to look at, but in the meantime, we are dealing with consequences of disasters that have actually uh, took hold already. And and there will, there will be some time lag before we see the uh, push and pull of a multipolar polar world uh, have an effect on, on what goes on globally and in the region. Great. Thank you, Bassam. Uh, we have many more questions. I'm going to try to merge some of them together. We have a very good question on participation from Kate uh, Henson. Uh, she says, what do you think the new government um, should be doing to invite a more participatory shaping or um, of policy with citizens? How far do you think this would be possible or re realistic? And how far do you think citizens are ready for this type of meaningful participation? And what remains to be done to support them to have more of a voice in decision-making process? We also have a question from Charlotte Plew, who's asking, what is the pathway to a homeland or Watan in the, uh, the protesters are calling for? And what is the role of women in the future of Iraqi government and state building? Well, the pathway has been stated in the variety of demands that the protesters have had since October, which basically revolve around a caretaker government that is not beholden to these militias and parties, a draft of a new constitution, this is one of the major problems. More accountability and dealing with the corruption that exists. To link it to the other question, whether, you know, irrespective of one's intention, this, again, to go back to the discourses about our region, 
whether people are ready for X. People everywhere around the globe, especially in 2020, are ready. Uh, it's not about the people. It's about the local and global and regional systems of power that uh, stifle them. Uh, so uh, Iraqis are ready and citizens are ready, but the government in Iraq is a product of the Mohassasa system where all of the militias with backdoor negotiations with Iran and with the United States have agreed for this government. What the protesters were demanding is an entire change to the entire structure, not changing faces. This is not a government that was elected. These folks are not representative. I mean, the, the prime minister is the head of Istikhbarat. So about the question of women, one of the great things, and people who haven't should go and look at clips and read uh, articles, that women were at the forefront of these protesters, uh, protests, uh, as protesters themselves, as medics, uh, and so on and so forth. And many have written already that this was really great because it was the return of Iraqi women to reclaim their place in the public space. Uh, a place that was not always shut off to them. For those who know, and looking back at Iraq's history, all the way back to the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. So women are participating, they are fighting, they are at the forefront with their brethren fighting for a new Iraq. They're fighting everywhere. So what, how would there be more participation and participatory? That needs uh, to have the entire system changed the system has proved that after 17 years, it is completely dysfunctional and it's completely shut off and it's not representative of the large majority of Iraqis. Uh, thank you, Sinan. We have uh, many more questions. One of them is, are Syria and Iraq fragile, failing or failed state? Uh, Bassam, would you like to answer this? And maybe you can also uh, read to us some of the questions from your Facebook. Uh, I, I actually got the question from a colleague, uh, but I am not directly on Facebook because I don't want to compromise the, the connection. Uh, so I will, I will solicit that uh, in, coming, in the coming minutes. Uh, I mean, the, the, the concept of a failing state uh, is a very problematic concept that some in the social sciences and particularly the political sciences or the political science, which is a much more uh, a field that is much more prone to problematic uh, narratives and conceptualization for various reasons, not least uh, the connection to power. Uh, that uh, is involved in, in, in political science uh, relative to other subfields of social sciences. And that uh, is the largest part of the story of the concepts such as failed states. Of course, these are problematic dictatorial regimes that have actually exploited their populations in ways that are uh, sometimes unspeakable. But we also have, uh, you know, failed democracies and we also have quote unquote, as in, you know, trying to look at the actual meaning rather than the terminology. We also have uh, democracies that, uh, that are failing and that are proving to be structurally uh, uh, racist despite decades and centuries of supposed development of which uh, we are living in one today in the United States, whereby uh, many uh, have declared that the experiment of the United States has failed and so on. I don't think these are, um, I mean, we can critique these things and these countries, whether it's the United States, Iraq, or Syria, and beyond. But I think it's 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 better to 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 leave out these these concept of failed and rogue and so on. The the fragility uh, does not just emanate from the local setting, even if the local setting, as I have been saying for years and years, if not decades, whether it's Syria or Iraq, the local setting is the primary setting for which we need to hold responsible. The Syrian regime, the Iraqi regime are the primary, uh, are the actors that are primarily responsible for the, problem, for the problems, the exploitation, the brutality. However, we cannot, just because we are prioritizing uh, responsibility on the locals, we cannot assume that these countries and regimes exist in a vacuum. The uh, broader context in which they exist and the support they are getting from external actors, as well as the support that their rivals or their neighbors are getting from external superpowers, 
is very much part and parcel of how these regimes have learned to adapt and cope and deal and exploit and repress and in turn being themselves uh, ousted, exploited, uh, invaded, and so on and so forth. That is just a complex reality that if you are the uh, uh, the victim of either of these scenes, you are sometimes excused in the sense that you, you, you're excused to act in terms of failing to see the broader picture. But the broader picture is more complex, even if we continue to prioritize these internal problems of these regimes. So the fragility comes from a series of developmental problems, a series of external conditionalities, a series of support for the problem itself. In other words, Saddam Hussein with uh, a patron like the United States in the 80s and uh, the Syrian regime with a patron like the Soviet Union and now Russia is actually very much uh, uh, an actor that uh, is repressing, is exploiting, but not without these external supports. And without these external supports, as we have seen in the case of Saddam Hussein in the 1980s or the Iraqi regime in general, we have an extremely weakened regime that was not worthy of the sort of brutal and barbaric invasion that took place in 2003. Same thing with Syria today, as we have seen or as we are seeing day by day in the past few weeks or months especially, the Syrian regime, because of some internal tensions uh, between it and its allies, is actually being gradually weakened in ways that are are, are palpable. We can we are actually witnessing that today, and and some op-eds and articles are calling um, or, or or already declaring the collapse of the Syrian regime. What I'm trying to say is that we cannot isolate the the internal local repression from the external support and external um, uh, interests in this repression. Uh, and, 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 and sometimes people get confused and try to absolve one or the other, and, and we cannot do that. Uh, now, I don't want to get into the details, but the one thing I mentioned earlier, and I want to just bring up right now, is that the actual developments within the Syrian uprising, for instance, since 2011, couldn't have actually taken place in the same manner uh, in the same destructive manner that it did without the vacuum that existed in Iraq, without Syria becoming an outlet for various groups that, for one reason or another, couldn't do what they wanted to do in Iraq, but then actually moved into Syria to create further chaos and so on and so forth. And people address these things separately from the other, from others because of what Sinan calls, in, actually in the film itself, uh, how superpowers and their publics are, are, are suffering from amnesia. We keep uh, uh, separating things from one another, just like liberalism separates politics from economics. We, uh, in, in, in space, we separate things uh, in time and space when we look at the relationships between these calamities for which we, or people here living in the United States and our governments, uh, or in, in the UK, uh, are partly responsible without ever absolving the local setting. And one of the problems here is that uh, people, because of the pain that they suffer and because the pain of the pain they observe, often are more inclined to focus on one aspect and, and not the other. And if we don't look at things holistically, and now if we don't look at the region holistically, it's very difficult to come up with any of these ideas of, you know, uh, 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 further democratizing these uh, polities, uh, the, the, even the role of, of, of women, as well as questions of development and isolation from what is happening regionally and how this region is connected to, uh, to the global context and the superpowers within it. You're muted. you are on mute. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Marcus Sam, can Hawk. you hear me now? Ajal. All right, thank you very much, Bassam. Uh, we have um, many more questions. I'm going to read some uh, to you. So we have a question from Ta uh, Talib uh, Shalabi, who is saying the U.S. and Western narrative had been that Iraq is, uh, is an, as a nation has been an art artificial mm. construction and by encouraging sectarianism should be split. Uh, although as an Iraqi, I don't believe this narrative. What is your opinion should be the new narrative that uh, can bond all Iraqis and end sectarianism? Uh, to you another question. Um, <clears throat> 
you just bear with me a minute, uh, from Dora uh, Agrabi. She says, uh, I would like to know uh, what the speakers think of the current situation. I was in Baghdad during the uprising, and as much as uh, it is interesting to see how peaceful protesters behaved, I personally think that change can only happen if the government and parties are pushed to their limits, probably through chaos and violent pro protests. What do you think? Well, I, let, let me just say, to quote my friend, uh, Ella Shohat, who says that it's interesting how neocons and conservatives become post-colonial critics uh, when they speak of the uh, how other nations are constructed. Uh, needless to say, every nation state on earth is a construct. Nation states don't grow on trees. But as you can see, the denial of history, for uh, it's always for other people. And the interesting thing when it comes to Iraq is that, while of course the various parties uh, and the various ideological trends were very opposed and have very differing visions as to what Iraq should be or whose Iraq is Iraq, but the calls for division always came from abroad. And the current contender for the presidency, Mr. Joe Biden, published uh, an op-ed years ago, co-written with, uh, with the Gelb, the head of the, one of these think tanks, calling for uh, three Iraqs. Um, of course, this notion somehow that Iraq was cobbled together by the Brits, it's repeated ad infinitum that people accept it. It's completely false, of course. There are very good articles written by Sarah Persley uh, on Jadaliyah in English and Arabic that talk about that. Um, irrespective of all of that, it's up to Iraqis to reimagine their country. But the most important thing is that in the 20th century, in the history of Iraq, we have numerous examples about what kind of Iraq can be imagined. And we have so many movements whereby, in which Iraqis from various backgrounds came together and expanded the notion of what Iraq is and whose Iraq it is. And again, I go back to the uh, protest of the last uh, few months because it was also a moment for young Iraqis to rediscover that while there is sectarianism also, of course, but there is a very strong history of Iraqi nationalism that extends from the late 18th century all the way to through the 20th century. Um, now the question about peace and violence and whatever, yes, of course, these, as I, I mentioned, the corruption and the billions of dollars involved because uh, this oligarchy is not going to walk away from billions and billions of dollars. But this question comes up uh, about how to change the system. And there have been instances where, and I completely understand that, where protesters were so angered that they torched the headquarters of a lot of these sectarian parties, of course, because of what they represent. And let's remember that the, the way the regime dealt with the uprising has been very, very brutal. I mean, 800 young men were killed, including some of our friends and until today, to go back to what the question was about the government, the government has yet, the regime has yet to have a committee that investigates what happened, who killed those protesters, who shot bullets into their heads and killed them. So for many protesters and many Iraqis, a government that is not willing to investigate this and to come clean is an illegitimate government. And... Um... Reem, regarding the question of, uh, you know, U.S. narratives and, and constructed uh, and imagined states, as Sinan said, uh, there is no such thing beyond this narrative uh, that describes any existing nation state. The, the problem uh, is that nation states, since we had nation states, uh, and since the time when nation states became the framework for international relations, they have become a goal. So you establish a nation state, national unity, a legal framework, a legal entity, and then you proceed from there to um, create uh, social integration and assimilation internally. And that had been an institutional goal that had been a dream for leaders, for people aspiring to actually be part of these states. 
But this is a different era. And I, I argue, I can argue that this has been the case for many decades, except that it took a long time for the broader uh, uh, view to actually catch up. And that is, we're no longer in a situation where a nation state is our goal. I mean, look at Palestine and Israel, look at the settled colonial uh, experience uh, in, in Israel-Palestine with uh, a, a very entrenched uh, problem. The answer is not even theirs, the answer is not to create a state. Same thing for the Kurds that actually exist uh, throughout three or four or five countries in, in, in the region, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Iran, and so on. The, 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 the approach should be much less about establishing the legal entity, which is the state, and then assimilate, and instead should, be, should proceed from the actual communities on the ground, kind of like what is happening in the United States today. We have a country, there is a country, there is a legal entity, there's a framework, there is some sort of quote unquote uh, unity dominated by uh, certain groups over others for the most part, uh, or in many ways. The approach should be more a concern with how particular communities, particular groups can acquire uh, equality, acquire their rights, Frankly, in various ways, I'm not going to, uh, you know, tell people how to actually do that. It's, it's up to them, their own agency. But this should be the starting point. And that starting point of actual self-determination of groups fighting for their basic, very basic rights at this point, that should inform what form these, quote unquote, uh, legal entities should take. Same thing with the question of Israel and Palestine. The, 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 the struggle for equality should inform, for instance, a potential binational, secular, secular as in accepting of all uh, groups, uh, state, rather than having things happen the way, uh, the other way around, where the solution creates a new problem to be resolved through further struggles. Instead of actually maintaining this, even well-meaning people wanting to see a change or wanting to see a resolution that is just, they start from the state, nation state framework. We should just invert this and start from the other framework because the solution to this alternative view that I'm suggesting is not a recreation of the problem that then has to be resolved through struggle. And that is basically a perspective problem. And the same thing applies, of course, in Iraq vis-a-vis -vis, uh, various groups not just the Shi'i, Sunni, uh, sectarian framework and lens that we've seen, or many uh, are see Iraq through, but also the ethnic diversity that exists in Iraq, and not just with respect to the Kurds, there are other uh, ethnic groups as well. So I, I am, instead of trying to um, uh, provide answers and, 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 you know, ultimate solutions here, I'm just trying to offer a, an alternative perspective to think about these matters, because the, 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 there is no uh, single answer or panacea. Great, thank you very much, Bassam. <clears throat> We're going to take two more questions. There is one from uh, Tasneem Rahman who's saying, um, "Do you think the main reason for the execution of Saddam Hussein was the underlying oil greed? For example, Bashar al-Assad walks free despite his atrocities." Another question from Tawfiq Ali. Uh, Will COVID-19 mark the end game for Iraq's mass uh, popular uprising, uh, which uh, he uh, hoped uh, wouldn't? So, or is this just a wishful thing? I mean, very quickly, I'll just address the Syrian versus Iraqi issue. Uh, one, one starting point is that uh, for the United States, Syria is not a prize, but Iraq is. So that actually changes everything that has to do with the involvement and relations and ability to uh, and, and willingness to mobilize. Uh, Syria is, 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 is more of a, uh, not a backwater issue exactly, but Syria is no, not something that the United States is willing to commit uh, vast resources to dealing with. And that, that is the distinction. Uh, the perspective of the, of the person asking the question is, is admired and I believe in it, but this, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, approach of, of this justice-driven approach to why things are different in different places despite similar atrocities is not the perspective that uh, powerful actors adopt when they are actually acting in the world. And, and despite the atrocities that happen on, uh, on both sides, on either end in Syria and Iraq, the treatment, the development 
the developments on the ground are different. Uh, Iraq is not only a prize, but it actually came to a point where it began, in the, at least in the minds of decision makers in the United States, it got to a point where it might actually threaten other prizes that the United States has in the Gulf, for instance, and the desire to protect uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries became another driving force to deal with Iraq in the manner that it was dealt with. And not because of the oil. The United States, I mean, this is now common knowledge, didn't interfere uh, and, and, and invade and so on in order to get the oil. The, the United States uh, basically imports a, a small percentage of the oil it uses from the region. So this is not it. It's very much a practice of powerful actors, empires, if you will, whatever you want to call them, to prevent other players from actually dominating that source. That is the main driving force. And in the case of Iraq, there was enough there for the United States to commit resources, just as there was enough there in 1990, 1991, for the United States to send more than 450,000 young men and women to restore the problematic, misogynistic, authoritarian state there at that point. So it's, it's, it's always the, uh, uh, driven by the size of the prize, at least uh, uh, nearly always, with very rare occasions where the United States and people speak of the United States intervention in, in Bosnia and so on as, as an exception. But these are exceptions. Uh, thank you. I just want to say briefly about, about COVID uh, that, of course, uh, COVID has limited movement in public spaces, and uh, but, but some of the protesters are stayed already in Tahrir and elsewhere. But what's important is that, ironically, that COVID itself is going to re-energize the protests, I think, because sadly now, the numbers of cases and of people dying because of COVID are increasing in Iraq. And uh, this is bringing back the same questions about after 17 years, the state has yet to actually fix Iraq's health system, which is in shambles, and has not even built a single hospital. So the catastrophic way the government and the Ministry of Health is de dealing with COVID and the number of people dying is going to even fuse and cause more anger on the part of protesters when COVID hopefully uh, subsides. Uh, great, thank you, Sinan and uh, Bassam. Um, uh, if anyone has more questions, please uh, feel free to put them now. Uh, you can also raise your hand and we can give you the opportunity to speak. Um, I think I gave the opportunity to someone to speak, but I can't see, see them coming. Uh, Lubna, can, are you able to, to come in? No, uh, we seem to have lost Bassam as well. Uh, I see no more questions coming and I would like, aha, uh -huh, someone is coming here. Um, that is Bassam again. So before closing down, uh, Bassam and uh, uh, Sinan, uh, would you like to have uh, final comments and thoughts? Can you hear me, Bassam and uh, Sinan? I can hear yeah. you. Bassam, is your, uh, can you hear us, Bassam? Yeah, now, now I can, but I was, I was Would you skipped like out again for some reason. I was kicked out earlier, maybe, maybe because of my comments. <laughs> I'm used to it. No, not you. I, I just wanted to say something which Bassam touched on in a way in that, uh, you know, I know the audience is from all over the world, but many of the audience is from the UK and from the US. Something that Amy Goodman, the American journalist of Democracy Now! said once stayed with me really as I watch how the media covers Iraq and Syria and, and so many other struggles. And she said, we do not have state media in the US because the corporate media f does that role. And it might seem like it's, um, it's an exaggeration, but it's so true. And that the, the debate uh, about Iraq, about Syria, about history is always so impoverished on corporate media. And that applies, of course, to how 
it covers even local issues. I mean, were it not for what has happened in the last two, three months, we wouldn't have had this. The, it's the protest that forced the corporate media in a way to not look away and start discussing this issue. So that's just what I wanted to say, that those of us who live in liberal democracies and, you know, we oftentimes hear uh, how people, or read how people describe the media in North Korea and in, in Russia and elsewhere, and of course there are major problems there. But let's stop congratulating ourselves and try to be more vigilant and critical when we consume what the corporate media in our liberal democracies dishes out. And then emphasizing and stressing amnesia and going back to 91 and even earlier so that we realize the extent of the obfuscation, which is actually business as usual for corporate media. And not, not to also let academia off the hook in a way. And that's why I mentioned in, in my brief remarks about what I call imperial scribes. And they are scribes because all of these liberal platforms and some of the leftist also platforms were actually pro-war and joined the chorus. And the, you know, while again, I, sorry, I will repeat myself, where here we have the, people have the luxury to speak of it as a mistake or a miscalculation. What it means there is hundreds of thousands of deaths. And then there is an account on Twitter that shows you the, the, the horrors that the people in Fallujah have to deal with and the kind of defects that their children are born with because of the types of weapons that were used in Fallujah. And the skyrocketing rates of cancer in Iraq because of the depleted uranium that was used in 1991. Um, these things don't end, uh, they just don't go away. Thank you very much, Sinan. But, um, any final thoughts? Uh, my final thoughts have to do with my uh, initial comments regarding uh, the lessons learned and our ability as human populations living anywhere, but specifically human populations living in countries that can take decisions that are consequential for other populations like the United States, like the UK, <clears throat> like Russia, China now, and so on. Uh, we have a responsibility, first, not to forget. I mean, before developing a critical view and before raising awareness to the point where you, you, you take action, I mean, you, you have to first not to forget. And we're not talking about things that you don't know because things that you don't know, you cannot forget or remember. But things that you know about cannot be forgotten. And this is uh, an excellent way. What you are doing, Reem, and what LSE is doing with this webinar is a fantastic way of uh, reminding and even though people feel that, or some people might feel that, oh, I know all about the Iraq war, now we have other problems. No, we don't have other problems. It's the same problem. We forgot the genealogy of it, of which the Iraq war is part of a longer process. It's not the uh, initial uh, starting point, even though I called it the big bank. It's a big bank for a process within the larger development since uh, post-World War II. So that's, these are my final uh, thoughts. Uh, the other thoughts uh, that I always have uh, as I think about this, I as I watch the film and other films on Iraq and discuss Iraq, are very uh, personal, emotional um, uh, feelings and thoughts about the pain that was caused to millions of people at, at the hands of their dictatorships and their funders and their supporters. And that is something that uh, can, can and should always be part of the discussion. It is, it is not just a matter of an emotional response. It is actually uh, the stuff that produces uh, the, the research agendas, that produces our willingness to act, to mobilize, to organize. And I hope that we, we keep doing more of this, starting with not forgetting uh, before we even get to trying to raise awareness and uh, so on. Uh, thank you so much, Sam and Sinan. Uh, that was very, very insightful and rich. Uh, thank you from all of us. Thank you for all the people who attended and stayed with us that long. We are about uh, an hour and uh, 48 minutes.
thank you for uh, staying so long and thank you for our donor as well the carnegie corporation of new york for supporting us to do research on how to how we're going to build more legitimate states in the arab world states that acts for all their citizens as sam highlighted it is the same issue across the geography and uh, uh, through history. Um, thank you all again, and I would like to remind you that this webinar has been recorded and it's going to be uh, available at our website. We're going to email you all with the links, but you can also visit our uh, website, which I just shared with you in the chat, syrianconstitution.org or distort.org, and it's going to be all uh, also on uh, our Twitter. Uh, this event was meant to be real life events, in one one of the LSE's biggest, biggest theater, but sadly, because of the COVID-19 situation, had to be online, but then we also gained many other audience uh, across the world. So the, uh, that was a uh, you know, good outcome. We have so many Iraqis who couldn't have taken bar part otherwise. So thank you everyone again. Thank you, Bassam uh, and Sinan, and thank you for having recorded the Iraqi narrative of that very critical moment. Some of the questions, actually, some of the attendees were wondering whether you're going to go and repeat the experience again and try to capture the current narrative uh, in another documentary. I hope you will have this uh, opportunity sometime in the future. Thank you again, everyone. Welcome to the end of our webinar today. Thank you, Reem. Thank you, Reem. And I see some comments that are asking questions about research uh, from uh, different people, including uh, Ruba uh, Al-Hassani. Uh, I am okay with uh, providing my email. I'll put it in the chat if people want to reach out. And Sinan, yes, same here. the same, uh, in case people want to reach out. I just, just added it to the chat if people want to reach out. Um, Thank you so much, Reem, for this initiative and, and to LSE uh, and to those who funded this. But, but man, we're not going to Being the organizers, the Arab city. Cheers.